it was kind of a no-brainer for me. Um, they have a good, they have good crack. You can see that, and uh, I think that's something that kind of brings the best out of me as well. Eddie Dunbar, welcome to the Roadman Cycling Podcast. Cheers, thanks for having me. How are you, Eddie, from Glamorous, Cork? Yeah, not too bad. I'm just back. I actually only got back from the spin about an hour ago, so um, yeah, it's pretty pretty bollocks after that. But uh, no, I'm good. I said I'm back in Bantir for a week. Um, just came back last Friday to do a bit of training over here, and yeah, getting ready for GP Plouet this Sunday. What's uh, where's the home base these days? Is this still back and forth between Cork and South of France? Yeah, so well, this year I haven't had I haven't spent too much time um, in Ireland. Like I come back every now and then to a training block, but um, yeah, like three years ago I moved to I moved to Monaco, um, so I'm pretty much based out of there the whole time. Um, so it's just whenever I can come back, I'll I come back home. I love training here. Um, it's always just nice to do. A block of training or whatever so um yeah but most of the time i'm in monaco yeah training over there but there's no flat so, in monaco uh, that's the difference are, <laughs> like i know uh like we have a bunch of mutual friends and stuff and i know you have like a lap around Cantorque that you like you're going to do chain tight back in the day for a good hard session like moving to Ineos which is obviously you know they've been made famous by this accumulation of marginal gains and you know full on power meters all the time do you still ride a little bit off field when you're back home or is it all just absolutely dialed in everything weighed measured and you know taken account for now no I think that's why I actually like to come home um just because I have like the roads here that I can tell very easily if I go out and do a session how well I'm going just because I did it for years of how my body felt um, now funny you said about the <laughs> the circuit I I have here I actually went out today I did it three times and um, it was just like I hadn't done that in a while and I just went off pure feel and um, yeah it just kind of gives me an indicator of actually where where my condition is at um, because as I said Monaco is great it's a super place for training the only problem is there's very very few flat ro- flat roads so it's just like I guess I trained all the time where I had a good variety here down in like Bantir, Kentuck area. Like if I want to go hilly, I can go hilly. If I want to go rolly, it's easy. If I want to go pan flat, it's very easy too. Um, and it's just like with the nature of the racing now, with how hard it is, you're, you're on the pedals all day. Um, so it's just like tr- actually training back here is um, and- it's very actually easy to replicate a race. Like for the a good chunk of our audience, the vast vast majority of our audience aren't Irish. So for you know you and me, the over so excuse the oversimplification of it, but like Cantork, Bantir, it's an area in Ireland, right down the south of Ireland, where Eddie's from. And the man, I would say, you would agree, Eddie, who sort of kicked all that big movement you guys have off down there. It's Dan Corton, and like what. What is so special the water down there with Dan Corton that he fostered this sort of training environment, almost a high performance environment that stood outside of the high performance setup? Yeah, I think it was just like from a young age, he um he always gave everyone the same opportunity from like even when they, if they were under eleven, under twelve, all the way up along to um like junior level. Um he gave everyone like an opportunity to um be like he, he encouraged everyone to come to the club in the area you know like with, no matter like who they were what size they were what age they were you know there was none of that it was just like come in try it if you like it you like it and if you don't um you don't but he had a i think he had a great eye for talent or someone who was willing to work hard um i think that was one of the main things that i i kind of understood with danny after a while um so like if danny tells you that someone is a good rider the chances are he's he's a very good rider, you know. Um, but I think it was um my first was, uh, Dan Corton experience. I was down at the Cantor Three Day, 
and I was warming up and I'd missed the start of the Cantor three day stage one. So I'm out the back. I'm like, finish me warm up. I'm like, shit, where's the bunch gone? So I come back up. Dan Corton's still there in his car and he's like, they're gone. Like they're gone two minutes. He's like, I pace you back across. So I'm, he's like, hold on to the roof rack. So I'm holding on to the roof rack. He is fucking hooring around these country roads. I was like, <laughs> I'd done two bike races probably ever at this stage. So I'm going around one of the corners. We're going so fast. I've completely lost control of the steering. Like the wheels are coming off the ground going around the corners. I'm holding onto the roof rack for dear life. And I'm thinking, I'm dead. I'm dead. And somehow we got back to a straight road and I got the bike back on and rolled up to the back of the bunch. I would skid marks all over me, jocks. It was horrendous. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds like a... Sounds like Danny, all right, yeah. Um, we hear a few stories like that. Um, I think that's one thing as well. Everyone in the country, when you talk about cycling, the chances are they know who Danny is, you know. Um, but yeah, he's look. He was he's played a, played a massive role in my career, um, and plenty of other guys um, around the area as well. Because even last was it Saturday, I went on the spin, um, and on the spin you. Paddy O'Brien was there. Barry Mead was there. Um, Daniel Lynch was there as well. Um, and these Paddy, all guys can you be Paddy in a sprint? Yeah, I don't think I would. I don't think I would at the moment. No, but uh, he, he was um, <laughs> he's back in the bike training today. So um, yeah, so all these guys are getting ready for Charnival two day. I think in two weeks. So um, you would. They're just three lads you wouldn't want to see rocking up to the start line of the, the Charnival two day if they had any bit of condition, you know. But again. Danny had a, a massive part to play in um, in their careers as well, but it just shows the the talent that's kind of come out down from Kentucky area, you know. So you've obviously gone a long, long way from Kentucky to you know arguably the biggest team in the world. It's your reign at Ineos. I think for like one of the lads sent me a message there. I sent him a, an old uh, team at yours on the Irish team, Sean McKenna, trying to partner of mine. I was like, oh, I'll have Eddie on the podcast later. Uh, any questions for him? And he said, <laughs> he said, does he think if he was British, he would have already won a Grand Tour by now at Ineos? <laughs> <laughs> um, ah, look, I think. Their record in Grand Tours kind of speak for themselves, you know. Um, if you just look how many they've won in the last, um, what is it, last 12 years, kind of the Sky and Neos area. But um, yeah, I guess the last few years I, I didn't really get the opportunities in the Grand Tours that um, I maybe felt I should have, I could say. And um, yeah, I had that one time I did the Giro in 2019 and... Um, I think I went in on like it was less than a week's notice I got and uh yeah I I loved it I loved every minute of it and um I just the minute I finished I wanted to do another one um and I actually rode um quite well in the three weeks there so it was just kind of um yeah I kind of just craved to do another one and um it just the opportunity never came up unfortunately but uh hopefully now in the next few years that a few more doors will open in terms of Grand Tours and uh, yeah, I can see what I can do in them races finally, you know. But like, is there a conversation goes on between, you know, you and uh, Rod Ellingsworth or Dave Brailsford? Like, why haven't you been getting those opportunities in Grand Tours? Like, you went to Tour of Switzerland last year for Carapaz. Like, you were super strong and I think anyone who's an Irish cycling fan, you're just looking at this so frustrated because we can see what you can do in one week races. Like you're looking at this year, Copia Bartolet, which was a stacked field and you're winning there, you know, Tour of Hungary, you're winning there. And then you're overlooked for the Vuelta to tour the Giro. It's like, what the f- is going on? You give them a grand tour. Yeah, I think um, like last year, I think I would have actually done um, the Vuelta. I was fairly, I was 90% sure I'd do that. Um, but I got COVID after Tokyo. So that kind of messed that up. Um, but yeah, this year I look after Swiss last year. Actually, I was very close to doing the tour. Um, it was kind of, I think it was kind of hit or miss between me and one, one or two guys on the team. And um, yeah, kind of maybe after Swiss last year, um, I I look I, I rolled myself into the ground for Carapaz. Um, I think if I was kind of if I went there maybe as a leader myself, um. 
I would have been very close to the podium if I rode for myself. But um, at the end of the day, I went there to be a helper and uh, I did that job as best as I can. And um, I was more than happy to help Carapaz win that race, you know. Um, and I think it was just personally, it was just nice for me to win the Young Riders jersey there as well. Um, because like that, that was a, a stacked field there as well in Swiss. And um, I, was, I was in probably the best condition I'd ever been in. And I got better after Swiss in training I was absolutely flying so I thought oh, maybe maybe the tour is possible you know I just thought look I'm what was I at the time I was I was 24 at the time I was getting better in training I just done I was very confident um, and I thought it was kind of like in my head it was a no-brainer to bring me um, just to see what could happen um, not in terms of bloody winning the thing but in terms of doing a good job as a domestique you know um, which I thought I could have done very well um, but again yeah the it just it just didn't happen and um i kind of went all in then just kind of getting ready for the vault and that was one i was training for um and i think i was fairly i was on track to as i said to do that but um covid kind of hampered the plans and um yeah that was that last year then kind of done really but yeah this year in the giro as well um i was disappointed obviously to miss out on that i was Again, I thought I was fairly nailed on to do it. I thought I was definitely, um, I just thought I'd, I'd be one of the guys that'd go, you know, that I wasn't kind of in the category of, well, oh, should we take him, should we not take him? Um, and then, yeah, I got a phone call to say I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be racing, um, which is probably the hardest phone call I'd ever received as a cyclist, um, being honest. Um, is it hard to pick yourself back up after that? Yeah, like I was, look, I, I'm normally a fairly positive person anyway, but um, I was I was in a bad way for um, for a few days actually. Yeah, just just I think the one of the main things that was annoying me, I was flying like because I did like I was after winning copy. Um, I got a chest infection after copy. Um, like half the peloton did at that point. I think they were sick. I think it was that kind of March April period people probably would have seen you know that people were getting chest infections they were getting stomach problems um so like half the peloton was sick and uh yeah i kind of just took a rest built up slowly did like a really really good training block in in monaco with richie port um did tour valps but like with my coach and everything we i just trained all the way up until the day before of tour valps i didn't take a break into it and i rode very well there so I just kind of like, all right, if I actually tapered into that, I would have been, I would have been, I knew what level I would have been at in the race. But um, again, in my head, I was thinking, no, if I want to be, if I want to be good in the Giro, I don't want to be going flying in the Tour of Alps, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was all on track. I was absolutely flying in training. And uh, yeah, got a call about three days after Alps. I was up in Neve's house um, and we were just sat down for dinner and I got a phone call. Um, to say I wasn't picked and as I said it was yeah it was one of the I couldn't believe it actually I was one of the toughest phone calls I ever had and um, yeah I they just said that, that I wasn't selected and um, that was that was literally the long and the short of it really that was it was a very short phone call and yeah I didn't really I just actually I just stayed in the room for a while I was quite upset and um, was just trying to figure out why I wasn't picked um never never really found that out which i i understand too um it's professional sport you know you just have to kind of roll with the punches sometimes and um just move on from it and then yeah i was actually supposed to take a break um but then i was told a few days later i I'd, i had to do tour hungry um which i wasn't actually at the time when i was told i didn't want to do it i'll be honest with that because i just I just like I I just need a week <laughs> off just to fucking yeah just take this all in you know and um, I was flying in training so I just thought to myself look um, I can go there and I can win the race so why not do that I think that'd be um, be a good thing to do I think it show show good character um, as I said I'm always professional I do everything I'm asked I I train very well and um, yeah I I kept that going and. Um, I went to Hungary and yeah, just waited till that last day. The boys did a super job. We only had we only had five guys there, so yeah, went and um, won the GC. Would have been nice to win that last stage, all right, but um, it was just twenty five meters too long. But 
Um, Heartbreaking. That was, yeah, yeah. It was, um, yeah, it was a different feeling to copy. You know, it felt, um, yeah, it just was kind of like a sweeter feeling. Like where copy was relief, but hungry was just kind of like, just kind of yeah. Jeez, that was that was good to do that. You know. And so moving across now to bike exchange, you know, for anyone on the outside, it looks like, you know, bike exchange culturally going over from British team to an Australian setup, but bike exchange, like I've had so many of the lads from bike exchange on the podcast, like from Matt White to Chrissy O. Jensen to Sam Bewley. And it's like, it's a very Irish vibe going on in bike exchange. Like Chrissy O. Jensen is a lot more Irish than a lot of lads bearing the Irish flag in the peloton. He's a proper Wicklow lad. You must be excited about going over there with a mix of really relaxed setup, which it seems like you'll fit in well into, but also a chance to have a crack at some Grand Tours. Yeah, like, because I kind of, I just kind of, when I kind of made a decision that, right, I, I need to, for my for my own career, um, like, in Neos, it's been a great four years. I, like, everyone's amazing on the team. Um, like, the riders are, they're all a great bunch of lads, you know, I'm very friendly with all, all of them, and um, the staff and everything, they're all amazing too, so um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was actually, it was a tough decision to leave, don't get me wrong, because um, we're well looked after and stuff, but um, I just kind of weighing up then, where would I, where would I fit in best, mentally and physically, you know, because um, I'm, I'm a guy, I, I, I'm relaxed enough, everyone kind of knows that about me, but um I like to be serious as well when when I need to be serious or I'm told right this is um this is what you have to do and um these are the races we want you to go to um and I think bike exchanges ticked all in boxes for me um just there I know a good few of the lads from just chatting to them in the peloton um I know a couple of the staff there as well um so it's like it was kind of a no brainer for me and uh, they have a good they have good crack you can see that and uh, I think that's something that kind of brings the best out of me as well when you can kind of go into the an atmosphere that's it's good fun and you kind of look forward to going into that atmosphere um as well but i think with bike exchange there they can like offer me a, like a, a race program where i get i know what i'm doing from january until what the first six months and it's just like right this is what you're doing um we need to be good here this is where you like this is where we expect you to be good or um get a result here or something which is um which is good because like the last few years it's just kind of yeah like I, I raced a bit but not maybe as much as i wanted or in the races i wanted um and it's kind of a bit last minute sometimes as well um as to what i'm doing so for me to be at my best i need to know right i like yeah next year all right you need to be good in the zero like i need to know that in January so I know right this is what I'm this way I'm getting on my bike every day you know to be good in the Giro or like if you're getting ready and for how does that work do, they, do, they, do you build that into your contract do you build that into your contract early with them or is it just like a, a verbal agreement that okay this is your provisional calendar or is it built in where you're like okay I'm moving but you need to guarantee me at least one Grand Tour opportunity per year no like it does like I think um for instance, it's like I spoke with Bike Exchange and it's just kind of like, oh yeah, these are the races I think I can be good at. Um, but these are the races maybe I need to do in preparation to be good at that one. Um, but I think they kind of knew that anyway. Um, like even since I was under 23, um, they were a team that always kind of showed interest um, in me as well. So like they've watched me all up along and I think um, they have a, a kind of good idea of maybe what what kind of rider I am and what kind of race program I need to be good, which is good. But, um, yeah, it's more so like that in your contract that you'd be like, right, you kind of agree with the coaching management that this is going to be a program. Um, obviously it's subject to change sickness in injury, illness, whatever, but this is going to be the program and, um, this is what we're going to be working towards, you know? And I think that's, that's something that I haven't really had the last few years. And I think that's something that's going to make a big difference to me. Um, uh, like from a performance point of view you know and will you move coach next year as well do you coach in house with Ineos or do you use a tour party no so I'll be coached within bike exchange next year I think yeah um, most most teams now are um, like very like they have their team coaches or whatever and most teams use them 
um, like they're maybe if some guys like the older guys in the peloton um, they might do it themselves or they have someone that um, like third party coach they have like that because they're just I, I don't know when, when they're a bit older you kind of know what to do but um, kind of still I suppose at my age or just um, you kind of stay within the team and kind of yeah keep it yeah just keep it within the team and um, use the coaches that they have because every every team now it's every team have good coaches and have like sports scientists like nutritionists um, like every um yeah you can see in the peloton every team's dialed in now with everything you know so um yeah it'll it'll be um i think i'll be coached within the team yeah uh, do you enjoy going back racing for the Irish then yeah i love it like even last week um it was nice that we went to a race and um we were able to do something you know like we were able to we knew we went in we had a clear person that could win the race in sam you know um, and I think when you have that and you make it very clear that you're there to support one person, um, it gives um, it gives a lot of like confidence to the team and stuff. And I thought we rode actually very well last week with the like with the riders we had. Like, I mean, we I don't know we had a quota for six riders. We only had five. Um, in the end, that six man maybe would have made a difference to Sam if we could have saved Mullen a bit earlier like if, like Sam was the in my in my opinion Sam was the fastest there last week in the Euros you know um, but yeah maybe um, hindsight's a great thing but if if you look like the top three last week first second and third they all had eight riders um, on their team you know we had five um, so but in a race like that having like having the- an extra three men would make a big difference especially to Sam Yeah, and like this is the frustration as a cycling fan and someone still involved, you know, with racing here in Ireland. You watch Cycling Ireland being such a shit show with the Evo Pro debacle this year, just how unprofessional it is. But now you look at the current crop of riders we have, like we've you, we've Sam, who's the fastest man in the world, we've Ryan Mullen, who's fast becoming one of the best lead out men in the world. Like we've treated the really big stars of the sport. And yet we're going to this these races and we're not building, we don't have an infrastructure for you guys to succeed. And it's just like, as a fan, it nearly feels like Irish soccer in the 90s where it's like, you know, the, we have some of the best players in the world, but when the serious football starts, the Irish lads f*** off home and they let the big nations contest it. Like, Sam's off, like he's already won two stages in the Vuelta, I'd probably win more before we drop this podcast and we're going into races almost like as a bit of a holiday like and i'm going somewhere with this don't worry it's more like i'm looking at the, the course in australia for worlds this year and it looks like a f- great course for you and i'm like at this point now should there not starting to be plans built around it like i'm thinking cavendish and copenhagen in 2014 like they started planning that eight nine months out exactly what was going to happen for that race we just never seem to have that level of prep for anything yeah, um, and I think even like I've even I'm following the under twenty three toward Lavenir, you know, the last few days, and I think the the group of under twenty three guys we have as well um, at the moment is they're very high standard, um, they're performing at a high level, you know, um, yeah. and I think that's something not to be just like look like look past, you know. Um, I think they're probably. Since that's probably the best team they've had in Lavenir at that level, I think, since maybe we went there in 2018, when there was myself, Downey, Michael O'Loughlin, Dara Matney, Feely. Um, you know, it's just like, just the, the level was massive there. Like, with all the guys we raced there um, that year, like, they're winning the Tour de France now, or they're getting a podium in Grand Tour, so it's just kind of like... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's just like it's. I even said it to um, Nico Roach the other day. I said it's important they look after them under twenty three guys because they're good and they are very good. Um, and I've seen that. Um, but yeah, um, it's it's something that needs to be looked at. I think in terms of like getting like numbers in races, that just that's literally kind of on our shoulders, I guess, with getting UCI points or whatever. Um, so like I think in that sense, I think we've qualified four guys this year. Um, for the world, I'm not sure. I don't. It's on, I don't think Sam's points will actually count from the Vuelta either because it stops like the 15th of August, which is a bit annoying. But um, 
yeah, I think we have four guys to the Worlds. Um, but I'm, I'm actually not even sure if there's a team going to the Worlds, if I'm honest. Um, um, I haven't heard anything about it. But, yeah, look, we, as you said, we have some of the best bike riders in the world. Um, like, capable of racing for Ireland. And, uh, yeah, I think it's, as I said, like last week when we had six guys, you know, like that we had a quota of six guys to go and help in the race that we had a clear person who could win the race um, and we only brought five um, it's just kind of like yeah you know it's we're not giving ourselves the best opportunity to um, to help an Irish guy um, do something great you know um, and just to, to think about that how big that would have been for um, the country in general if Sam won the Europeans last week you know um, and it's just kind of like it's it's almost like it's it's kind of looked past, you know. Because I, I, the rhetoric even annoys me coming out of cycling Ireland. Like I listened to you know the likes of Martin Irvine talking about before the Ross, where he's managing an Irish team, and he's like, oh, you know, we're here to get experience and stuff, and you're like. You're not. You're here to win the race. You're not here to get experience. Like you've Rory Townsend on the team who goes and some wins nationals three weeks later, and you're talking about getting experience at the Ross, which has dropped down from a UCI status. It's like go and win races. The culture it just doesn't seem to be there to be like we're gonna win races. We're gonna put our stamp on that. Like maybe Rochi now moving into the DS, you know, bringing his wealth of experience is gonna slightly change that. But it seems like it needs to be more wholesale than just one part-time director sportive to change it yeah i think so because it's just like whenever we kind of went to a race when um like i'm just talking from when we were um under 23 or whatever but it was just that group we had we all believed that we were one of the best we went to that race and we all believed we were like one of the best teams in the bike race we never had any doubt any time we put on an irish jersey at an under 23 event in 2017 or 2018 we all believed like no fuck, we we're um we're one of the best teams here um and it was something i always tried to convince the lads of you know like no like we're here like um we're like that toward l'avenir that year it was just like we can all win a stage and we're all going to get an opportunity to win a stage and i think there was out of the eight stages we were top 10 six or seven times you know um but yeah it was it was never kind of back then it was never pushed on us it was kind of just like we did it ourselves you know like we like we went in we we used to go into each other's rooms every night at lavenier and we used to talk about what we were going to do the next day just amongst ourselves um and then even um <laughs> yeah it was mad even in like that one time we had a team time trial in lavenier we rode actually quite well and we were just we all it was, it was the six of us decided what we were going to do there you know and um even the last day um it was just kind of like um i felt i could win the stage you know and i got the boys to ride in the front for me and they did a they did an amazing job you know we were first into the into the foot of um oh, what's the one with all the hairpins i forget the name of it but anyway we were and the boys they split the race to bits you know but they loved doing that you know and they were on like it was great but like <laughs> as i said it's just it's all just it, like if you can kind of get it amongst yourself we we all had belief at that time um but i think it's just trying to maybe get the people higher up to believe it too you know so it's like we're not going to a race anymore let's say oh geez we're ireland you know we only have two fellas in a race or a championship it's just like no fuck, you have we have four and five guys qualifying now for these races we need to bring them and um go there and actually show like um you know we can we can win this race you know um but as i said it's it's just kind of... And even Maddie it's, Tegger, it's obviously like a few levels below you, lads, but like Maddie getting fourth to Commonwealth Games, like was a big ride for him getting fourth in the Commonwealth Games. Yeah, but Maddie's a brilliant rider. And he um, like he always has been, and he's a good friend of mine, and uh, he's a he's a classy bike rider, you know. Um, he's one of the best riders I know out of any peloton who, who can ride a bunch, like, as well as he can. It's incredible. You should see him in the bunch, even last week in the Euros like in basically a world tour field you know um he's unbelievable in a bunch and he's great at positioning you know so it's just like yeah he's a great bike rider um and when he needs to he's a kind of like punchy or like if you bring him on a punchy kind of circuit he's 
um, he's a hard fella to get rid of. Um, so it's just like, yeah, like we have we have guys like that we can fill the spots, but it's just kind of convincing people to to do that, you know. Like even last year at the Worlds, um, I think what's the consensus? We had six spots, and we brought three. You know, yeah. and it's just kind of like what's the consensus I, with uh, Ben Healy because. I know Ben Healy in Irish media has been the subject of a lot of controversy because he rode the Irish Time Trial Championships this year with a British Union Jack sticker on his bike. And, you know, for anyone not aware of the cultural or historic context between Ireland and England, there hasn't exactly been friendly relations between the two countries for a long time. And Ben is born in the UK, but now declaring for Ireland. Is he, you know accept it on the R squad or is there a little bit of a you know look we're moved we're we're beyond being England's B team we need to have our own identity now yeah I've actually I'll be honest I've never done um, a race with Ireland with Ben actually um, so yeah I actually don't know I, I was there alright when I, I seen all the stuff regarding nationals and whatever um, yeah, which was a bit, as you said, it was a bit controversial, you know. But I do, I do think if um, you class yourself as Irish, um, and you come to an Irish national championships, um, you you should have the right um, flag on the bike. I think that's just out of respect to the country itself and the race itself. I think, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just like I don't think. Yeah, it's. Um, yeah, as you said, I, I can I can see why the controversy was caused or whatever. Um, but as I said, I I don't I've I've seen Ben in races and stuff, and he's a nice guy to chat to and everything. And um, yeah, I'm not sure it was I don't know was it him that put the flags on the bike or the team. I think maybe it's the team actually. But um, I seen someone had a go at JV on Twitter. I think as well about about the whole thing. But um, yeah, as I said, it's um, yeah, I think that's just important. Obviously, um, yeah national championships in Ireland to um, come and just have have the right equipment you could say and um, yeah just respect the race more so than anything so Eddie as you can imagine uh, Irish you know one of our big superstars homegrown I came up racing against you actually a funny story I remember your Ross stage win uh, on the Irish team the one we went over Mount Leinster that day I had a part in that stage win that you won't know you were you went we went into the bottom of Mount Leinster, you went in well positioned, but about two, three bike lengths back from you, there was me and Matteo Sagala. And we went across a cattle grid just at the bottom of Mount Leinster. Matteo went to accelerate, snapped his chain, brought me down, and we like roadblock the whole road. And you and the Aussie <laughs> lads went clear, and only a few lads got back across to you. So that's like a little my little part in your stage win that day. Um, I was actually I funny now when you think back I was wondering how like it actually split so easily because I expected a bit more to be a bigger group <laughs> over the top but I actually I remember that now because I, who was there? I think Dowling was there for a while he got through um who else yeah yeah there was one other was a few like, lads all the Aussies on the ground through. yeah I bet you right the steep bit wasn't it yeah like, right, right there like, yeah <laughs> right there yeah, yeah I remember that now actually I, I heard it I should say yeah I didn't see it but I heard it I'd say that stage win cost you a few quid that day, did it? Yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> no, as I said, it was... Um, I remember I was just like, I ain't helping these boys at all coming in the road, you know? Like, there was three of them. Like, I knew they were three of the best under-23 bike riders in the world, you know? Not in Australia. These guys were three of the best in the world, you know? Um, and I just, like, I remember kind of arguing with the, the Aussie DS that day as well. Um, and I think I'd... I'd yeah, whatever... But I was just like, no, I, I'm not. Um, I'm not losing this stage anyway. So I just, I sat on. I must have sat on for about thirty five k actually. But fuck, it was even hard in the wheels. Let alone like pulling. It was hard <laughs> in the wheels. I remember that. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, that was an important one to me. And a lot of my family were from that area. So, um, like my granddad was, like lived like twenty k from there. Um, my dad was buried about 20 kilometers from there in Tolo and stuff so it was uh, it meant a lot for me to win there so there was uh, there was definitely motive to win you know uh, so I knew Eddie was coming on the show today and so I reached out to some listeners for some questions for Eddie so I got a question here from a lad not sure if you know him Dylan O'Brien 
Oh yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Dylan is, I think, one of Eddie's best mates. He said, "Can you ask Eddie what happened there back in December? We were out for a few points. Myself, Eddie, Dan Corton, Stephen Shanahan, Kevin Hayes, and Barry Mead." Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it was it was after I did the. It was actually after we did a training camp. Um, I. We were two weeks in New York or whatever. I flew back to Ireland. Um, did a 5K in Newmarket. Um, and then it was like, I don't know, like the 20th, 22nd of December, 21st of December or something. And uh, I said to the lads, oh, we were all like, the lads were off work, I should say. I was back from a training camp, so I had a few easy days going into Christmas. And uh, it was around the time the pubs closed at 8. And um, we were all like, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll go on the bike really early. The lads were down at like three o'clock and uh we were like, Oh yeah, that's grand. So we, we went out, I got back from training, um we went into town, Dylan went straight to the pub, into the stand in Kentork, the pub is called. Um on his way over he, he found Danny in the stall, so he asked Danny would he come in? And Danny literally closed the stall, went into the and he said, Yeah, I'll be in, in twenty minutes but yeah, I got food anyway with Kevin and Stephen Shannon. We went over um to the stand then after a while Danny came in I was actually behind the bar pulling the point actually um for Danny as he walked in to make him think I was working there but obviously he knew I wasn't um but we came in anyway sat in the corner and this is it's funny because it's only like four o'clock you know and it's just like you feel it feels like it was like nine o'clock in the evening but uh yeah we went out we were drinking a few pints of Guinness um yeah bearing in mind I hadn't really drank in about three weeks I'd say because I was on training camp in Mallorca yeah. so I was after a uh, heavy training block there so um, the points hit quick dead <laughs> but Danny came in we had a good crack with him and Barry came in he was in another bar in Kentuck he came in to join us and uh, we, were, we were having a great crack actually and then Danny Danny looked at his watch and I think it was like half six he said oh we'll go over we'll go over the bridge for one Dan's grand we all left the bar anyway and we went over the bridge to a pub called Barrett's for another drink um and then it got to like eight o'clock we were after a few drinks and um danny just left he was gone so we said oh we'll, we'll go get some we go <laughs> we'll go get some chips and i was like, we were like yeah that'd be great now so we left the pub i remember we were all walking over there happy out um again like it's only eight o'clock you know and it's just like what the hell is going on but anyway got to the chipper um I went in, happy out, ordered my food, delighted myself, curry, chip and cheese, chicken goujons. Um, and the boys, Dylan and Stephen and Kevin, were still deciding what they wanted. Now, in the chipper in Kentuck, uh, Viking Pizza, it's called, actually, it's in the corner, there's like a table, but like with high high chairs or high stools. And uh, I was just like, oh, that looks great. Now I go over and I sit in there while the boys order. Um, so... Sat up in the stool, Dylan and Kevin, like, and Steve, and actually, Kevin was outside, maybe, or he was sat down, and they were just stood in front of me, and I, I just went, sat in the stool like this, and, uh, <laughs> whatever happened, um, I fucking fell forward off this high stool, went face first between Dylan and Kevin, and completely split my head open, <laughs> off, off the chipper counter. Oh, fucking hell. Yeah. <laughs> completely completely knocked myself out and I just I remember like fucking the scene stars I was like fucking hell and uh, I just all I remember was um, Dylan uh, fucking he just picked me up by the jumper like that and uh, I just like in shock I was like Jesus and I looked and the fella behind the counter was just like fucking hell Jesus Christ <laughs> and uh, I was just like I couldn't and then after that I I like, fuck it, I don't really know. I can't remember anything. I was completely knocked out. I had proper gash. I probably needed stitches, but Neve, Neve was collecting us, and she was saying, um, she was saying, I think I need to take you to hospital. You need stitches. And uh, the lads were like, No, he's fine. He's fine. And she was just like, There was just like there was just blood coming from my head, and they were like, oh, He's bad. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> and uh, in the end, it was fine. I went back, and uh, Neve put scary. Thankfully, Neve put scary strips on it. That kind of saved. Um, 
save me getting stitches, I think. But uh, I woke up the next day with a fairly sore head, and it wasn't it wasn't from the Guinness. But um, yeah, it was. I was, I was I was actually concussed, so I was just like I was proper I was proper knocked out. Like cause I I said to Dylan, if he wasn't there, I don't think I would have got up. I couldn't have got up. He just pulled me up, and I had no choice but to stand. But um, and then I just remember, I remember I woke up at like. Uh. I was in bed, yeah, at home in bed by nine o'clock or something, and I just can't. I just woke up at like three in the morning, wide awake, because I was after like eight hours sleep already, because we were out so early, and I was just like to Dylan, I was like, "Fuck, hell, gee. I was like, my head all right?" I was like, "My head's really sore." He just, he was telling me that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but yeah, that was, that was, yeah, I, I. A bit more careful when I go into chippers now, all right. But um, it was funny actually in in Kentark now. If you walk into that chipper, <laughs> it's like there's like a there's like yellow um tape across it for no one to sit down. So maybe maybe I wasn't the first. I was the first and last to do that. But uh, yeah, it was it was funny, all right. Yeah, uh, I love that. Got all the way back uh, to the right, team Eddie. Finish well, up. I'm gonna finish up with a. Oh, Jesus. I, I want to finish up with a few questions. So, little known fact, my mom's actually from Cork, and I spend a lot of time down in Cork. So, I've put together a few Cork-only questions to test, are you actually truly Cork, or are you going to showbiz down in Monaco these yeah. days? Yeah. Be interesting, though. So, it's like, question one, what is a Creole? A King Creole from KC's, isn't it? KC's in KC's and Douglas. <laughs> Many a time KC's I said and Douglas are dead. What's a wazzy? I actually don't know that. Wazzy. Wazzy's a wasp. I think it's a Cork City one, though. Do you know what about that? I'd say not. In Kentucky, they say wasp. All right, all right, I got you. I got you this one. What's what's this one mean? If somebody says in a sentence, like you ask them a question and they say, "I will, yeah," what do they actually mean? They won't. <laughs> they definitely one hundred percent won't. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, cheers, man! It has been a pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Anton. Cheers for that.